Okay, so today I thought we'd talk a little bit about Martin Milmore. Martin Milmore was a sculptor working in Boston in the 1860s and 1870s. Milmore was born in Sligo, Ireland in 1844, and after the death of his father in 1851, Milmore's family emigrated to America. Milmore attended the Boston Latin School, and as a young man, he approached sculptor Thomas Ball to take him on as an apprentice. Thomas Ball will be best known to Bostonians for the equestrian statue of George Washington in the public garden. In fact, Ball had just set up in the former Chickering Piano Factory to construct the George Washington statue. Now, the one address I could find for the Millmores was on Hammond Street, which is also on Tremont Street, and in fact, it's only a block or two away from the piano factory. Thomas Ball was reluctant to take on a student, but Millmore's drawing ability convinced him to do so. Among Millmore's earliest works is this bust of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. On my last visit to the Museum of Fine Arts, I was wondering if they had any Martin Milmore pieces on view, and there is one. It's a bit hard to find. It's in a lobby just outside the American Wing. This is a portrait of Edith Roch. She was a figure skater and tennis player in the early 20th century. Back in Roxbury, Thomas Ball arranges for Martin Milmore's first major commission. Milmore was asked to sculpt three Roman goddesses for the Horticultural Society for a new building that was constructed on Tremont Street in 1865. The three statues were Flora, goddess of flowers, Pomona, goddess of fruit trees and orchards, and Circe's goddess of agriculture. The building was demolished to make way for a new horticultural hall over on Mass Ave in 1901. For a time, the three statues were saved by Albert Burridge, the Horticultural Society president. But over the years, the statues were lost, thrown into a swamp by vandals, in fact, where the brackish water destroyed their limbs and faces. An effort was made to find and restore the statues, and today they can be found at Elm Bank, the current society's headquarters in Wellesley, Mass. New faces were sculpted based on two women who led the restoration efforts. Viewed at eye level, the proportions of the statues seem a bit off. This is because Milmore intended these statues to be seen from street level on a three-story building. He used a foreshortening technique to enhance the perspective. From Wellesley, we'll head over to Cambridge and Mount Albert Cemetery, where we'll find two works by Martin Milmore. The first is this angel in memorial to Maria Frances Copenhagen. Commissioned by her mother, the face of the angel is a portrait of Maria, and the angel carries a golden trumpet. The other work is this sphinx, designed by Jacob Bigelow as a Civil War monument. Jacob Bigelow was a physician and a botanist, and with the help of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, he helped found Mount Auburn Cemetery. Bigelow designed several of the landmarks in the cemetery, including this Egyptian revival gateway in 1832. Egyptian revivalism is architecture that takes influence from the most use of ancient Egypt. It became popular after Napoleon's conquest of Egypt in 1798. Examples of Egyptian revivalism can be found throughout the 1800s. One of the original designs for the Lincoln Memorial was, in fact, a pyramid. Isaiah Rogers is influenced by Jacob Bigelow's gate at Mount Auburn for a new gate over at the Granary Burial Ground. Coming into his artistic prime in the 1860s, the American Civil War will have a great deal of influence on Martin Milmore. In fact, the rest of the works we'll be looking at are Civil War monuments, and it is what he's best known for today. Among Milmore's first Civil War monuments is this copy of the Lion of Lucerne, which can be found in Colby College in Maine. The original Lion of Lucerne is an 1820s rock relief found in Switzerland. It commemorates the massacre of Swiss guards during the French Revolution. Traditionally, a war memorial would celebrate a great victory, a triumphant general sitting on his horse like Thomas Ball's sculpture of Washington over in the public garden. The Lion of Lucerne and Bigelow's Sphinx represent a new allegorical type of war memorial. Milmore selected a single massive piece of granite from Hallowell, Maine to sculpt the Sphinx. He and his brother sculpt the Sphinx at a space across the street from the cemetery. Bigelow intended the Sphinx to represent post-war America working towards a brighter tomorrow. An ancient symbol of wisdom and strength, the Sphinx faces north towards the future. And a uniquely American bald eagle is worked into the headdress of the Sphinx. 
flanking each side of the Sphinx is an inscription in English and Latin. And while the Sphinx would be considered Egyptian revivalism, it's good to note that the face of the Sphinx is female. Egyptian Sphinx are actually typically male. While Greek Sphinx are female, the riddle of the Sphinx is actually a Greek myth. And the meaning of Bigelow's Sphinx has certainly riddled many viewers. Enigmatic is a word seen over and over again to describe it. It was, however, a popular attraction when it was unveiled in 1872. Another soon-to-be-prominent sculptor, Daniel Chester French, comes to visit the Sphinx and is quite impressed with it. He's equally impressed with Martin Milmore. He described Milmore as a dashing Edwin Booth-type figure. Edwin Booth was the leading actor of his day. You'll find Booth buried here at Mount Auburn, although his legacy today is a bit overshadowed by his brother John Wilkes. Jacob Bigelow never got to see the Sphinx completed. He had gone blind by that point. But he was able to touch and feel some of the intricate carving of fur and other details. Bigelow died in 1879, just a few years after the Sphinx was unveiled. He's also buried here at Mount Auburn. The chapel that the Sphinx faces was also designed by Bigelow and was named for him after his death. You'll find Martin Milmore's monuments to the Civil War dotted throughout New England. This one here is over in Charlestown in the shadow of the Bunker Hill Monument. And bronze copies of the figures from the Charlestown Monument can be found at a monument in Fitchburg. 600,000 Americans die in the Civil War, and the imperative to memorialize these men who went off to war and never returned was felt in cities and towns everywhere across the nation. This obelisk on the Lexington Green was erected in 1799 and might be considered the oldest war memorial in the United States. On the front is engraved the names of the eight men who fell that morning in April 1775, and seven of those men are buried beneath it. This listing of the names of the fallen becomes a distinctive American theme for memorials. In fact, some towns issue the building of monuments at all and construct public libraries or memorial halls. Harvard University builds a memorial hall in honor of its students. Almost invariably, though, you'll find some kind of tablet with the names of the fallen inscribed inside the building. The tablet pictured here is at Belmont's Town Hall. The next work we'll look at from Millmore is iconic and really sets the tone for Civil War monuments going forward. If you live anywhere east of the Mississippi, there's a fair chance that you've run into a statue that looks somewhat like this at some point. This is the Roxbury Soldiers Monument. It can be found over in Forest Hill Cemetery in Jamaica Plain. Milmore sculpted it in 1867. It depicts a common unnamed soldier with his gun at rest. His youthful face gazes downward with a weary, thoughtful stare. Along the walls on the grass beneath him are carved the names of his fallen comrades. At the dedication of the statue, Ralph Waldo Emerson noted that the only speaker that was needed that day was the silent soldier that was standing before them. This standing or citizen soldier so captures the country's mood that it serves as the reference for hundreds if not thousands of similar sculptures. You'll find numerous cast bronze copies by Martin Milmore all over New England. This one is in Amherst, New Hampshire. This one stands in Framingham outside the Memorial Library. This piece in stone is found in North Brookfield, Massachusetts. And again in bronze, we'll find this one in Keene, New Hampshire. But this is only a partial list. There are many more to be found. Other sculptors are working in the same vein as Mart Milmore, most notably called Conrad's, who unveils this version of the American Volunteer in Deerfield the same year that Martin presents the Roxbury Soldier. A colossal 21-foot version of Conrad's American Volunteer can be found in Antium, Maryland. And you'll find an example of the American Volunteer in Braintree, Massachusetts. And again, there's a much longer list of examples. Conrad joins with James Batterson in Hartford, Connecticut at the New England Granite Works to produce statues for cities and towns across the nation. Demand is so strong for this type of monument that a firm called the Monumental Bronze Company is started up in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1875 to mass-produce these kinds of statues. These mass-produced statues were sold as white bronze, which is actually zinc. These zinc statues offer an affordable alternative to many cities and towns. Exposed to air, the zinc forms a thin oxide layer which protects it from further decay. 
The one here can be found in Pembroke, Massachusetts. This one is in Salem, Massachusetts. This zinc model in Anasquam is one of six Civil War monuments that you can find in Gloucester. Monumental Bronze also offers headstones, and once you can identify the distinctive blue hue of the oxidized zinc, they become easy to spot. We found another example in North Brookfield, but the era of zinc monuments is short. The company stops production at the outbreak of World War I. The final piece we'll look at from Mark Millmore is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Boston Common. The monument sits atop Flagstaff Hill and rises to a height of 126 feet. At the base, there are four large bronze statues and four bas-relief plaques. At the top of the monument is a figure known as America. In one hand, she holds an American flag. In the other, she holds a sword and a laurel wreath. She wears a tiara with 13 stars, representing the 13 original colonies. The positioning of the large figures on the monument is intentional. The American figure faces south towards the secessionist states while the sailor figure faces east towards the ocean. The figure here represents peace extending an olive branch. The figure holding a book represents history. And here we find again an example of Milmore's citizen soldier. The panels on the side depict various events of the conflict. On the east side is the outbreak of war. On this panel, Martin hides a self-portrait of himself as a sailor. Also depicted is the USS Monitor. The panel on the south side is called the Departure as troops march off to war. Again, we have some hidden cameos. This is Edgar Allan Poe, and this is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Others depicted on this panel include Colonel Shaw of the 54th Regiment and General Benjamin Butler. The panel on the west side depicts the Sanitary Commission, which was a civilian relief organization. Louisa May Alcott serves with the Sanitary Commission, and she writes about her experiences in her first best-selling book, Hospital Sketches. The final panel on the north depicts the return where victorious troops are presented to Governor Andrew. Also on the side is Charles Devins, Charles Sumner, and again we'll see a citizen soldier here on the side. Every Memorial Day, 37,000 flags are planted beneath the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, representing all the Massachusetts service people who have been lost in action since the American Revolution. Martin Milmore's career was brief, but prolific. He died at the young age of 38. He's buried at Forest Hill Cemetery in Jamaica Plain, where you'll find his Roxbury soldier. Daniel Chester French designs a monumental bronze in honor of Martin Milmore and his brother, who is also buried with him. Death in the Sculptor, or The Angel of Death and the Young Sculptor, is completed in 1889. A young Milmore is shown with a hammer and chisel working on the Sphinx that we find over in Mount Auburn Cemetery. The shrouded figure on the left, representing the Angel of Death, reaches out, gently staying the sculptor's hand, and cuts his work short.